Hidden away in a corner of Manchester University's medical school, this is Richard Neve. He has an extraordinary skill. By measuring the skulls of men and women, he can recreate their faces to show how they looked when they were alive. This reconstruction helped him to identify as Scandinavian a Finnish girl hitchhiker whose remains were found near Oxford. Another started with an ancient burial in northern Greece. These bones ended up as a vivid portrait of Philip of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great. We'll be following Richard as he faces a new test to give us a living picture of a murdered man whose background we've been investigating for the last 18 months. Ever since, his distorted body was found in a Cheshire peat bog some 2,000 years after his death. The scene of the crime was peat diggings called Lindo Moss, south of Manchester. Because the corpse came from a bog, he was nicknamed Pete Marsh. But to scientists, he is known as Lindo Mann. My name is Ian Stead, and I'm a deputy keeper at the British Museum. Had it happened the, the cut before it was actually dug up? Just missed it. But the, the legs certainly roughly hadn't been. Around again, you know, in six months. Last year, we reported that Lindo Mann was murdered. His skull was smashed. He was garroted. Then his throat was cut. And finally, he was dumped in a pool in the bog. But we've had many more problems to solve since then. Now that the body is out of the bog, how can we preserve him for exhibition? We've had to use means that nobody's ever tried on a body before. And what about the date that he died? We planned a series of radiocarbon dates. The first was 500 BC, around about the beginning of the Iron Age. But the second came as a shock, AD 450, a thousand years later. And that's given us a real headache. But we can tell you more about the events leading up to his death. And we can also show you what he looked like when he lived and breathed. Richard Neve brought him to life. Basically, I use the x-rays to give me the information to build a model skull. The nasal bone itself is quite well defined and appears to be relatively undamaged, so that gives us a good mark point. Having drawn outlines of the form of the skull from the radiographs, it was then possible to remove the distortion to some extent. And I did this by altering the shape of the outlines of the skull as little as possible until we arrived at a shape acceptable by present day standards. The next stage is to prepare a core or armature by drawing the outlines of the front and side views of the skull on light fiberboard. In this way, you have an accurate uh, template or outline of the side of the head and the front of the head and then by fitting shelves if you like into this to support the clay later on you produce a very strong armature upon which the next stage of the modeling can proceed but while Richard Neve was making good progress our attempts to date the body were creating the first of our problems. I returned to Wimslow, which has Lindo Moss on its outskirts, feeling pretty puzzled. Right. Our first radiocarbon date, 500 BC, was wrong. And the latest figures weren't easy to explain to a press conference. Well, I really want to know, sir, how old is Linlow Man? 
uh, two laboratories have been working on this. One has produced a date which, when calibrated, is early in the 6th century AD. And the second has produced a date which, when calibrated, is in the 1st century AD. So there's quite a big difference there. And the radiocarbon dates for the peat are in the 3rd or 4th century BC when calibrated. So how many years is the discrepancy at the moment? Uh, it's damn near a thousand years, it's isn't nearly it? A, it, it nearly a whole millennium. Yeah, a millennium, yes. Uh, we're arguing the toss between the, the Iron Age, the Roman period, and the Dark Ages. Um, but come what may, he's, he's, he's ancient um, and, and, and jolly interesting, regardless of the days. Yes. Clearly, the laboratories had to try again. While we waited for their results, we also had to preserve the body for public display, our second problem. Could we learn some lessons from Denmark, which has the world's most famous bog bodies? One of the best was found at Graubella in eastern Jutland in 1952. Graubella man's throat had been savagely cut. He is now on view in the museum at Aarhus, preserved by the method of tanning. We'd never tried preserving a bog body before. Could the tanning technique be used by my colleague, Sheriff Omar, who'd been landed with our problem? We consulted the Danish museum's chief expert, Dr. Jesper Trier. First he was immersed in water with oak bark for one and a half year. And thereafter we have used uh, Turkish red oil to impregnate the body for another half year. And at last we have used glycerin, lanolin, and cut liver oil to make the skin nice looking. Well, did you have any shrinkages at all after treatment? Yes, for a long time um, everything looks very well, but uh, after 10, 15 years uh, we did have some cracks. There's one over here and one for further down uh, the leg. Another, even more famous bog body, was found at Tolland, only a few kilometres from Graubella in 1950. This man, naked apart from a leather cap, had been hanged or strangled. His head was preserved with treatments of alcohol, toluene and waxes. Thirty years later, it still looks very impressive. It's a very beautiful head and in very good condition. But it's true, it has become much darker and it has shrunk as well, 12 to 14 percent, which is quite much. So that still left us looking for other possibilities. This is an Iron Age shield which has been found quite nearby and it has been freeze-dried. Basically, the shield was frozen in vacuum. Frozen water inside it then disappeared as a vapour, leaving the wood cells undamaged. Sharif also had used freeze-drying on wood. With, with the freeze drying um, um, also, um, you are able to get a very nice surface texture, unlike that of other techniques. So you are able to see quite a lot of variations on the surface. Mm. But, uh, but have you ever freeze dried a bog body? Unfortunately not. Since uh, the war we haven't found any, and uh, now it is the problem for you, Mr. Sharif, to, to hand your problem. So you're on your own, Sharif? Yes, it looks like it. But help was on its way from Ireland. Sharif's colleague, Margaret McCord, arrived at Holyhead in the small hours with an unusual cargo. Today I collected uh, the body from Trinity College from a fridge in Trinity College, Dublin. The body is uh, female. Um, 
excavated about a decade ago in a bog in the northwest of Ireland. Good evening, madam. Hello. Um, you come into the Red Channel. Yes. Do you have any goods to declare from Ireland or from the ship? Uh, yes, I've got standard duty free of uh, two half bottles of spirits and 200 cigarettes. And that's your total, is it? Please? I've got a body in the boot as well. Oh, have you? Yes. Oh, can, we, can we have a look at that? <laughs> yes, of course. Do you have papers to cover that? Yes, yes, I do. The Irish called the body in the boot her ladyship. This is a special casket, is it? Yes. Right, well, we won't open that. I'll just have a look at the papers now and clear Fine. it. Fine. Right? Okay. And we're bringing her across to the British Museum to treat her, preserve her, probably in the same sort of way that we will be treating Lindo Man. And after treatment, she'll be returned to the Dublin Museum for them to display her or not as, as they wish. Sharif had already done tests with pig skin before the Irish body arrived. So he was ready to start work preserving it straight away. One of the great problems in conserving anything that was once alive is to stop it shrinking. The amount of shrinkage can be checked with marker pins by seeing if they move closer together during the treatment. between two pins on the left hip. It's 15.7. Then, before the body can be freeze-dried, it has to be soaked in a chemical called PEG, polyethylene glycol, which is similar to the antifreeze used in car radiators. You okay? Yeah, fine. Do you want to drop this in first? Both of them, I think, together. Peg helps the body keep its shape after freeze drying. It was fortunate that Sharif could work with two bog bodies. But they aren't quite as rare as you might think. The first archaeologist to see Lindo Man, Rick Turner, has been delving in the records. It's surprising how Lindo Man was hailed as the first British bog burial. And the, the totals that we're coming up with after a relatively short time delving into these records are really quite staggering. I think we have 85 remains of human bodies from peat, from England and Wales, 65 from Ireland, 36 from Scotland. In past centuries, several bog bodies were found south of the River Humber in the waterlogged Isle of Axholm. Every January the 6th, the ancient hood game is played in the village of Haxey. And in the game, Rick thinks he's found another level of evidence outside archaeology, a living link with bog burials. The connections start with the word bog itself. The officers of the game are called boggins. So we have boggins, boggart. They dress in, in red and they also have floral hats. They're, they're led by the Lord or the King Boggin. <laughs> the other game is called the Fool. Uh, he's blacked up. Uh, and he stands and he opens the game in, in the middle of Haxi, standing on a cross. We're gathered here today to play the ancient game of Haxi Odd. And during his speech, uh, you will see that uh, straw is set alight at his feet, and even his clothing is sometimes set alight at his feet, and perhaps he's even being sacrificed on the cross outside the church. In earlier times, he even sat within a noose that hung from a tree during the smoking. He then leads the company in procession out of the village onto the hoodland where the game takes place. The Lord carries a stick, a, a wand of woven willow, 13 celery willow sticks bound together. 
Uh, this is very like the sticks that you get associated with some of the bog burials that we find lying alongside them. Here. Get for the back. All on you. He carries 12 hoods. Uh, these are sacking hoods. Uh, again, uh, bog burials are often found wearing caps, leather caps. Tolland man has a leather cap. It's house again house. Tone again tone. If thou meets a man, knock him down, but don't touch him. He throws these in the air, and then they're competed for by the company. And the final act of the Haxi Hood game, the, the main purpose of the game, is to fight for the Sway Hood, which is a very stout, uh, leather-bound rope. Right. But this is a Sway Hood! And again, we may see parallels with the nooses found around several of the bog burial victims' necks. This is thrown in the air, and they then uh, spend two or three hours trying to force this hood into a local pub. <laughs> the event takes place on January the 6th, which is 12th day. It's also called Old Christmas Day because of the change in the calendar, exactly in midwinter. And where we've been able to analyse the stomach contents of of the bog burial victims, it does suggest a midwinter date. Uh, and all this really combines together to suggest that what we're dealing with here is, is about renewal, the coming of a new year, uh, about the rebirth of vegetation, uh, and even about the, the annual cycle of, of ploughing and harvest. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that uh, the Haxi Hood game and perhaps these sacrifices are all part of the yearly cycle, the annual renewal. While Rick was building up his picture of the religion of Lindoman's people, Richard Neve was beginning to reveal the features of the man himself. By now, he had made a cast of the skull and fitted the pegs which showed the average thickness of soft tissue, muscle, fat and skin, over the bone. So the muscle groups are put in place, the eyeballs are fitted into the eye sockets, and by the time the muscles forming the upper and lower eyelids, the muscles of the mouth and the cheek are placed in position, the face has itself, to a large extent, taken its own shape. The wizened features of Lindo Mann look very different from the strong face which now emerges by building the muscles up on the skull, it allows and ensures that the face develops from the surface of the skull outwards, which is in complete contrast to the way the average sculptor works. So I am not determining the shape of the face. The skull and then the muscles on the skull are deciding the form that it is ultimately going to take. The reconstruction is more than Richard simply demonstrating his skill. It is to present all the facts in a manner which everybody can understand. To put it all together so that a child and his parents can see it and look at the remains and then look at the reconstruction and consider the remains as once having been a living person. The man's hair, moustache and beard still needed fitting. But Richard's own work was nearly finished. Lindo Mann was appearing as a person. And the body itself was going into the freeze dryer, a steel tank in the basement of the English Heritage Headquarters in London. The real Lindo Mann was due to spend a month in here. He'd already been steeped in peg, like the Irish body before him. Success with her ladyship had encouraged Sharif and Vincent Daniels, his scientific advisor, to go ahead. It's been a boon. It worked very well. It shows the surface texture very well. And it's also been a godsend as far as the hair is concerned because it hasn't mottled the hair. And you can see it's very nice. Yes. Um, it's almost as good as new. Has there been any shrinkage or change in coloration? Yes, it's gone a little bit lighter. And yes, we've had a little bit of shrinkage, but luckily 
nothing more than 5%. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. As a matter of fact, it's less than that, actually. You can see the skin but would the treatment work on Lindo Mann? Sharif's theories were about to be put to the test. The month's drying was ended. The body was ready. But had the experiment been successful? I couldn't predict what was going to happen. So obviously I had to live with that. I'm just hoping against hope it will be all right. A final check showed that the body's weight was steady. There was no more water to be extracted from it. Now came the crucial inspection. Would Lindo Mann have shrunk too much? Had his colour changed? Might he simply fall apart? Doesn't look bad at all, does he? His nose has stayed a decent shape. Yeah, and his ears stayed bad. But he doesn't look waxy at all. And the texture is really great. I mean, in comparison to um, the Danish yeah, yeah. bodies, it's, it's incredible. I can oh, see all the details you want. Yeah. There was very little shrinkage of the body. Only 3%. Oh, but it's, it's wonderful. It's and even Lindo Mann's belly button was perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. The experiment was a success. Margaret, you did it. <laughs> Here, right. give me a hand. Give me a kiss. Right. <laughs> I'm going to sleep tonight, definitely. <laughs> I think you won't be the only one. Yeah. Well, I might even buy a bottle of champagne. But we still hadn't solved the dating mystery. One of the final set of laboratory dates was centred on AD 500. The second was around AD 100. And 300 BC was the date for the peat. Perhaps we needed to forget the body and learn something from the peat itself. Down in the New Forest with his students, Dr. Keith Barber from the University of Southampton. Bogs, you know, are a bit like a giant natural compost heap. The layers of peat build up over the centuries, composed of the remains of the plants that can tolerate this kind of environment, acid, waterlogged, and without oxygen. Plants such as this, the sphagnum bog moss. This plant holds water and it also acidifies the local environment. And in pools like this, you have in the bottom mud of algae of various sorts, very gungy. You've got the sphagnum growing around the edge and you've got cotton grasses and other grasses, heathers, things like that on the higher bits. Is this the kind of pool in which Lindo Man would have been dumped? Almost identical. The species are the same. We can tell that from the peat boring that we'll do in a moment. Um, the species in the peat can be identified under the microscope and we can reconstruct this kind of environment of 2,000, 2,500 years ago and say with some certainty that the bog pool was like this on Lindo Moss. So poor fellow, last thing he saw was this pool, or a pool like it, as he went down for the last time. OK, let's get this caught. I'm going to need a bit of help here. That's it. That's far enough. OK, twist it. And a big heave. Yes, rather nice, Pete. There are different layers in peat cores. They're created when the types of plant growing in the bog change because the climate alters. When we come to this distinct layer here, this greasy mud, we are coming to a climatic catastrophe. A catastrophe that happened about 600 BC when bog surfaces over the whole of England, over the whole of Europe, suddenly became flooded with water. This was due to a change in climate. And if you want a modern analogy, you could say that this was like the summer of 1985, writ very large indeed. After that, 
we go into our present climatic period from about there, 600 BC onwards, up to the present, we're in a cool, wet climate, an Atlantic climate, and the peat formed in this period is fairly well preserved, and it accumulated at a rate of about one centimetre every ten years. Lindo Moss had more secrets to give up to another expert on ancient botany, Professor Frank Oldfield of the University of Liverpool. What did he think of the lab dates for the peat? They seem remarkably consistent to me. We have dates from immediately above and immediately below the body that are very close to each other, and they agree very well with the dates we have from the peat column alongside. And they suggest that the peat envelope which surrounds the body dates from about 300 BC. That makes sense. The age of the peat is one thing the radiocarbon labs do agree about. 300 BC, the middle of the Iron Age. Vital extra evidence comes from the trees and plants which grew near the bog and shed their grains of pollen into the peat. Well, the pollen evidence shows that immediately after the uh, body was put into the peat, the landscape changed. We see the forest being cleared. We see um, lots of charcoal blowing around and being deposited in the peat, suggesting that people were using fire to clear the woodland. And we have cereal and weed pollen, which shows that there was a good deal of farming activity in the local landscape. This kind of activity is rather the sort of thing we see for late Iron Age and early Roman and Romano British times. So that again points to a date a few centuries BC. So what do we make of all these dates then? None of the carbon 14 scientists can explain to me why there should be a 500 year discrepancy in the dates from the body. And until that can be explained, I think that it would be wise to regard all the dates from the body as suspect. But there's no argument about the dates from the peat. And there seems every reason to suppose that the date of the body is the same date as the peat that surrounds it. And we do have one small independent clue, and that is in Lindo Mann's last meal, in his bread. Because the combination of cereals that went to make that bread is absolutely the combination that you would expect in the middle of the Iron Age. And in particular, it includes Emma wheat. And Emma is an ancient variety that would be unusual in any context after the birth of Christ. This is far from being the last word on the subject, but I think that for the moment we've got to conclude that Lindo Mann was executed here sometime around 300 BC. He was dumped in a shallow pool where the acids of the bog preserved him forever, giving us something that's quite unique, the face of British prehistory. You can compare Richard Neve's reconstruction and the real body for yourselves in an exhibition starting at the British Museum in July. <laughs>